All right, we are recording right now. The screen has been dimmed, and here is the intro. You're listening to eLearn Chat, where talk is knowledge. Hello, and welcome to eLearn Chat, our new podcast featuring prominent leaders, shakers, and movers in the eLearning and training <coughs> industry. Your co hosts are Rick Zanotti and Terrence Wing. And hello, everyone. I'm Rick Zanotti, and next to me is Terrence Wing. We are virtually next to each other. Yes, we are. Hello, everybody. How's everyone doing? It is September 28th, and this is Elon Chat, I believe, 33. Woohoo! Terrence, we have a special guest today. This should be a fun show. Yeah, absolutely. We have uh, Connie. I'm going to butcher her name, even though I've known her now for, I guess, about a year or two. Um, yeah. But Malamed. Did I pronounce it right? You did oh, very well. All right. See, I, I've been so used to calling you Malamed. And you either know, so way, now it's okay. You shifted it on me, so I, I've got to pronounce it right. So if I keep practicing that, then I'll, I will get it right. But Connie is the, uh, she's an e learning geek. And if you've ever attended a, an ASTD conference or an e learning guild conference, you've probably bumped into her. Um, and if not, definitely make it a point to get to her sessions. Um, I've attended several of her sessions. And, um, the one of the most valuable sessions at, at the conferences I go to. So, you know, if that's not an endorsement, I don't know what it is, Connie. But Thanks. she also authored uh, Visual Language for Designers. A very good uh, book. Yep. Rick, Rick has it. I have it. Kindle version. <laughs> so welcome, Kindle Connie. Version. Thanks for joining us, Connie. Oh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot for having me. Connie, where are you located? I'm about an hour north of uh, D.C. in oh, okay. Maryland. Right in the thick of things. In the thick of things. Yeah. Or in the thick thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, the thick of things came out this way because we, we had the president just killing our, our L.A. traffic uh, for us on, <sighs> I think it was uh, Thursday. So well, just keep, being, it's keep just them being... over there, will you? <laughs> it's just being first you start with the economy, then you do the traffic. It's it works. That's right. That's right. But anyway, it's not anyway. a political show, ladies and gentlemen. It's <laughs> eLearn Chat. So we're here to talk about graphic visualization and Connie is definitely a pro in that. So Connie, first let's let's start with uh building a foundation, some common ground here. Uh what is graphic visualization? There are a lot of ways that uh people think about visualization, but in the context that we're talking about what we mean is how to express through the visual channel ideas, concepts, uh, make suggestions, any way that you're going to use any type of visual and e-learning from the most concrete to the most abstract. Okay. If that, if that covers it for you. <laughs> yep, that does. That does. Um, now, how did, you, how did you kind of find your way into this, into this field? It was, it was a pretty natural occurrence. I was an art major at one point in college, not a particularly amazingly talented one, but I was an art major. And everyone said, well, you should get teaching credits. It's, it's, a, um, it's a secure way to go about it because artists never make a living. So I ended up uh, getting a degree in art education, and I really found it fascinating. And then when I got my degree in instructional design, at, I was in, uh, living in Austin at the time, I noticed that as we went through the curriculum, nobody was discussing how we should use graphics in learning. And I would have thought that there would be an entire course in that. And I just kept looking around and looking around and saw a lot of uh, varied research, but not anything that, w that had pulled it all together. And after that time, a few really good books came out. And I wanted to do one that was a little bit more cognitive science oriented. So that's when I came about and wrote one too. So I've, I've added to the collection now. Now, how did you get into the cognitive psychology part of it? That's, I find that fascinating. It's a real interesting tie-in to something most people don't really look at, which is the psychology of learning. Yeah, well, I don't really see how you can be uh, an instructional designer, e-learning specialist, without at least giving some thought 
to the cognitive psychology aspect of it because that's what it's all based on. And I was lucky enough at the University of Texas to have uh, Robert Gagne's daughter, Ellen, who's a cognitive psychologist, as a professor. And I took a course with her, and she was just excellent and just took off, just started studying it a lot on my own. That's great. Did you ever read the, uh, there's one book I really enjoy, um, and it was by Hawkins. He's the uh, founder of mm. Palm Computer. It's called On Thinking. I have not read that Very one. Very good book, and he talks a lot about how our brains perceive information, how they've done research where, for example, they can apply um, an electrode to your tongue, stimulate the tongue, and you see through your tongue. It's fascinating wow. because the receptors, once they go into that the brain, amazing. all basically are, are interpreting the same exact stimuli. It's really fascinating. I think one, one fact that seems to be going around a lot now, and I see it mentioned in a lot of the TED Talks, is that we use more, uh, re more resources are devoted to vision than to any other sense. Some people say we learn 80% of what we, what we know is through vision. And, you know, I don't, I'm not really sure where the statistics come up, but just in terms of the physical brain and, the, and its processing power, vision is, is much more, uh, it's much stronger than any of the other senses. Well, part of that's because the brain is, is really a pattern recognition machine. Now, the patterns can be auditory, they can be smell patterns, but the patterns more commonly that, that we associate the, mo the most with are the visual ones. They're the easiest to identify. And I think that's yeah. probably where that's coming from. It's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. It's fascinating, and I think one of the reasons that they're the easiest to identify is simply because we have more neurons devoted to them, to processing that information. Because... Uh, something that's so fascinating it's not just one area i mean it is one section the back brain but where we process different visual elements are are spread around right. and there's and the thing another thing that i find so fascinating is that there are cells for to process color information cells mm -hmm. to process motion cells to process depth so it's it's distributed all over the uh, all over the place and and it's so fine tuned that's what i like about it <laughs> yeah that's true um, now, of course, that doesn't account for the neuronal deficiency that's going on around the world, but that's another issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Giselle, Giselle, excuse me, Guy, Jay, Jeg, S, L, I'm sorry, Giselle, LLC, I, I, I'm killing, I'm butchering your name to death here. I'm sorry about that. Um, but he wrote a comment in the, in the chat window, and he said that um, he found this really interesting because he thinks that, or he's convinced that the brain is is a quantum computer um, that we can we can reprogram. I will agree with him 100%. Yeah. yeah. Some cool people need to, to return their computers. Well, because if, if you look at the brain, the brain is a time machine. It can go forward, back, present. Um, and if you look at other cultures, like let's say the Maori Indians uh, and Aborigines, they feel that all time is one. Forward, backward, past. The brain can perceive that. It's pretty interesting. Past, yeah. present, future are one. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, mm -hmm. that's an Eastern and, kind of philosophy. And quantum too. physics is getting there. It's sort of interesting how... 5,000 years after the Taoists first came up with that, quantum physicists are saying, you know, time is really one. There's just from different streams of time and how you perceive time, what you do with time, and, and how it's, you know, basically how time is interpreted yeah. is very, is, 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 is really one. We have the power in our brains to move back and forth. You know, memories are time, if you think about it. It is. And so many people okay. are lost in time, but that's another issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, Connie, you, you gave us some uh, some great graphics. Uh, what do you say we, we take a look at those graphics and you tell us uh, what what you want to tell us about these? Okay. And I just wanted to let you know that I, um, I'm i just looking at the graphics now. I decided to turn off the uh, – for, for bandwidth purposes. So oh, okay. Just to, make sure, just to make sure we're on the right well, one. Well, I'll, I'll let you know when we're on. This is the first one on visual okay. and auditory inputs. Great. A lot of people already know, are, are aware of this cognitive uh, psychology model, but I always like to bring it up in presentations just to put everyone on the same page. And essentially what it is expressing is that you can think of our, our minds as a funnel where we're taking in a lot of sensory information. And in multimedia, we're generally concerned with visual and auditory um, we don't do a whole lot of touch, and we don't do 
although you could say interactive is touch, but visual, the visual and auditory channels. And I would say that most people generally agree that visual and auditory are separated, uh, processed in two separate channels. So we, get, we have all this visual and auditory information pouring into sensory memory, which it just holds the information for a brief sec, uh, nanosecond, really. It's very short how, how quickly information comes into sensory memory. And because it's really too much information for us to handle, we kind of funnel it down to what's most important and what completely grabs our attention and we bring that into working memory and and working memory is our like our uh online scratch pad it's where we manipulate information and probably everyone uh who's listening also knows that working memory is really it has a very short duration, just a few seconds, and it has a very small capacity. They used to talk about uh that it would have five to seven bits of information, that that was its capacity. But the latest research is showing that it's closer to something like four bits of information. So it's and really how you small. define a bit is that just depends on what you're working with. What were you going to say? So, so it is really small. It, it is really small. When I was writing the book, I, I contacted uh, Stephen Coslin, a... Um, cognitive scientist at Harvard, and he's a really big name in the field, and he works with uh, mental imagery. And so I asked him, and he said, well, at least visual working memory is, a, is more or less four bits of information. That's what they're thinking of now. So, And I think as instructional designers and learning specialists, learning architects, it's working memory that we're always bumping up against. That's why less is always more when, when you're uh, teaching something. And perhaps that's even why informal learning is so important because people can regulate how much they take in when they're learning informally. You just stop and pause if you can't handle anymore. <laughs> and anyway, then often the goal in learning is to encode the information into long-term memory, and we encode it into a network of previously encoded information. At least that's the way you can really give it meaning. And that's why everyone says... Always relate information to previously learned information. Always relate something new to something what you already know or use a metaphor like a funnel because this is something people already know Then you have a network to connect your, the new information to. Which is interesting because it brings it back down to the pattern recognition machine. Right. You, you recognize yep. those patterns and all of a sudden it all becomes easier. Right. We have these patterns all stored. It's, it's, it's just fascinating and it's really... It's really wonderful. It makes me, every time I go through this, I, I feel such gratitude for just having consciousness and being alive and having a, such a, a brain that functions so well, <laughs> but, uh, some of the time anyway. <laughs> uh, I'm going to put up the second image right now. Okay. I've got that in front of me too. I just thought I'd bring up some of the more fascinating tips about the brain that relate to uh, visual learning here. And here, it's just an infographic about who's not washing their hands. It's a little bit depressing. It shows you uh, by activity. I don't know if you can clearly see the type, but that's not really the point. The reason I wanted to bring this up was because there's a fascinating phenomenon that our brains uh, do, and that is it's called pre-attentive processing, that we are constantly scanning the environment on an unconscious level. So you can never really be aware of pre-attentive processing. And by, process, by scanning the environment pre-attentively, we are really trying to make sense of the world so that when it's time to pay attention, and all of this is happening in nanoseconds, when it's time to pay attention... We know what to pay attention to. We've, we've made something coherent and given the world structure. Well, we can leverage this ability when we create e-learning graphics or any kind of learning instructional graphics by creating graphics that are attuned to pre-attentive processing. And one of the things that we notice during pre-attentive processing is grouping. And this was discovered by the... Uh, the Gestalt psychologist in the 1920s. How cool is that? Mm -hmm. So there are certain conditions that make us see things as groups, and one of them is proximity. When we see elements grouped together, we assume that they have a relationship, and we perceive elements that are close together as a group. And if you look at these little drops of water it's, that are grouped together, one group's on the left, one group's on the right. 
it's nearly impossible to separate them, the little drops, and to see them as separate individual elements. That's how strong our ability is for grouping. So therefore, if you want, if you're teaching something just like this is, one group is by activity, one group is by location. If you're teaching something and you want to show that there's a relationship, then you should group those items together. And the thing is, this might be something that you, you might do unconsciously, but it's really good to get conscious of it so that all of our graphics are intentional and not haphazard. And the converse is also true. You have to make sure that you're not grouping things and not putting things too close together that are completely unrelated because that will cause an error in perception and, and interpretation. Did that make sense? It did. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, cool. It did. So, I'm going to bring up the third one now. And this, is, this was a, a very interesting one. This is the one I found depressing. <laughs> Actually, I'm really on all of these psychiatric <laughs> Some of them are good. <laughs> so <coughs> this is another one of those grouping examples. And the Gestalt psychologists also figured this one out. And that is similarity. If something is similar in color and shape and size, we tend to group it. And that's why you see uh, this shows psychiatric drugs, uh, the most prescribed psychiatric drugs in the United States. And, you know, it's kind of funny. I, there's actually a little bit of a, I think, a, an ability to misinterpret this graphic, and I think that's interesting, too. And that is that when I first saw it, I thought, okay, Xanax is mostly prescribed in the West and Valium on the East, but I don't think that was their point. I think they were just trying to... It's actually shape. the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, we are in the neuronal deficiency zone right here. She, she, she's an East Coaster, so she was trying to, you know, <laughs> she's trying to be uh, nice tell about us it. that the cycles are here. <laughs> Which she's right, that we are here. Oh, that's funny. But anyway, <laughs> I, I just thought that the, mis the potential for misinterpretation is really interesting uh, because I think they were really uh, trying to make it cute. You know what I mean? They're showing drugs in the United States, so they put it in the shape of the United States. But they probably didn't realize that there was a slight possibility for misinterpretation. Now, it's but interesting. Anyway, when I first saw the graphic... I thought the West Coast was the most messed up in terms of the color and the, the without even looking at what the legend was, I looked at color and I go, wow, we're really messed up on the West Coast. And then I kind of worked my way east and then I looked up and I started interpreting. It was re real interesting. It is. It shows you how you can misinterpret things too. And of course, the artist, who I'm sure is very talented, you know, didn't, didn't realize that that could happen. But anyway, the point here is that similarity is another condition that uh, predisposes our minds to group things. And you can also see uh, one other thing that pre-attentive processing does. It, it, uh, it uh, allows us to see certain attributes of graphics that pop out. And I, I noticed the red first because mm -hmm. bright colors will pop out, and that's something else that you might want to be aware of for pre-attentive processing. And, of course, you can combine these things. So if you're making an e-learning graphic and you want the learners to look at something right away, it's the top of your visual hierarchy, then you can make it bright to pop out, and you can group it with other el similar elements if you want it to you know, if there are several elements to show. So someone will automatically get the message, look at this first, this is bright, and there's meaning here, there's a relationship between some of these elements. So those are just different ways to uh, leverage pre-attentive processing. I, I love to leverage our information architecture and how the brain mm -hmm. works. I mean, our cognitive architecture and how the brain works. Okay, I'm moving on to the fourth picture. I just thought that this fourth picture was a nice example to show people who might not be able to render because to be able to, you know, to, to draw, because to be able to be a visual designer, you actually don't have to draw. And everyone can learn some of these, you know, use some of these tips and learn some basic uh, design foundations to be able to create better graphics. And here's a, a very simple one that uses proximity which we just talked about, and mm -hmm. similarity that we just talked about. And instead of always using numbers on your, in, in, in e-learning and, and statistics, when you're uh, presenting statistics and facts, this is a very simple way to get a point across just using circles, 100 circles, and color the ones that you want to show for percentage. And you're using the grouping principle, you know, this, the similarity principle, and you're expressing something more visually, yeah. 
And I just thought this was a good uh, example of something that can be made fairly easily. So would you say that compositing is, in some respects, more important in graphic design than the actual ability to draw? Yes, I would definitely say that a graphic design, a very good explanation of graphic design is organizing visuals and type in space. Hmm. And so if you get to... If you, I think I'm, I might be giving a full day course at uh, the, one of the uh, e-learning guild uh, events, and I think that would be in March. Great. And and that's that's the kind of thing I would like to talk about to, to teach e-learning people about space, how to use or space, how to organize in space, a little bit about typography, and some about visuals. I'll definitely look you up in March because I'm planning on going there, and that's exactly the kind of topic I find most interesting in learning. Cool. I do too. <laughs> All right, so let's go on to the next one. And this is kind of an interesting little fact about learning graphics. There, we, we tend to have the idea, so I guess it's a, somewhat of a myth, that photography, that photographs, realistic, very realistic visuals would be the easiest to learn from. But actually... And particularly for novices, minimalist graphics are easier to learn from. And by minimalist, I mean there are fewer colors, less detail, smoother surfaces, minimal shadows. By smooth surfaces, I mean you don't have a lot of texture. And I think this is a good example. I mean, you can pick and choose what you want to do for minimalist graphics. Perhaps you do want to have color in yours for a particular reason. But I think this example is good because... The, I think that the instant you look at this graphic, you think of business people because they, they're, they're in suits and they've got ties and the women are in suits. And also you think, oh, okay, there's a map, there's a globe, so it's, this is probably global or international business. Mm -hmm. And that really only takes an instant to recognize that. So our brains will really fill in the missing information and I think it's important to remember that we don't have to express everything in visuals because our brains are always looking for meaning, so they'll always fill in the missing information. You know, that's an interesting point. In, in, Doc, in Hawkins's book on thinking, you know, we, he talked about liars, people who lie a lot, who are compulsive liars. And what they're finding is what they have are gaps in their cortex where the memories are stored that they fill at the speed of light with whatever they think happened. They actually, it's wow. really fascinating. They create their reality as they go. And in <sighs> essence, they may not even know they're lying. And nine out of 10 times, they have no clue that they're lying. They're wow. filling in gaps. It's like a hard drive that's all fragmented. They're trying to find the fragments that are missing. And how do you put those together? What do you do with those fragments? Well, you just make it up. And, and it's, a, it's a function of the brain to fill in gaps so that it doesn't get confused. Hmm, that's it's amazing. Really interesting. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next graphic. Okay. Yeah. And it's fine if we don't have time for all of them. I was just I just sent. I think we know. can. Okay, cool. In this one, who who do we have here? Do you anyone does anyone recognizing her? Michelle. Yep, we've got Michelle. I, the reason I asked was because I just find it so fascinating. It's another minimalist graphic. It's to show you that silhouettes are, are a great way to abstract a graphic. And um, our brains fill in and missing information. And the graphic was about how Mich what Michelle Obama wears moves the fashion industry. Hmm. People go out and buy what she wears. But that wasn't our point. The point was was that it doesn't take much. Now, usually silhouettes are just a flat area, an outline filled in. But you can put in a little detail. You can outline a picture that you want to use in a graphics program, or you can buy these kinds of silhouettes in stock photo sites. And uh, they just work well. The brain fills in the missing information. And when you're trying to teach something, this might be all you need. I just you, wanted to show you, that. You know, Connie, that's fascinating because that goes back to when we perceive through the eyes, it goes through V1, V2, and all the different visual sensors, the first one's really blurry. The second one's a little bit sharper, and by the third uh, sensor, you kind of recognize the image. But in the first one, for example, if you saw a hose lying on the street, you might think that's a snake for a moment, just for a brief moment. And then in that nanosecond, it moves on to, no, it's not quite a snake, but it's green. Oh, look, it's a hose. And... 
and that's kind of the same thing with that image you just showed where it starts out you see the image and you it's a little blurry but you start kind of putting it together by the second one you're going oh that could be michelle obama oh wait it is um but it's it's so quick it's really fascinating and it is fascinating and when my cat sees a hose she thinks it's a, a snake so that hmm. she's probably not um, it's those primal sensors <laughs> trying to figure out what those little <laughs> images are. Yeah. All right, amazing. I've got the next image up right now. Okay. Um, this one is by Nigel Holmes. He's just a brilliant uh, il illustrator, information graphic artist. He was head of the uh, graphics at Newsweek for years and years, and I just had the opportunity to meet him at the presentation summit, um, a, co a conference that kind of overlaps with training in an interesting way. Anyway, he made this graphic a long time ago, and it showed, I, I wanted to show how line art can be used to, it's another way to abstract graphics and to reduce, you know, all the uh, complicated visual cues to just make things simple. I just thought this was kind of brilliant. What it is, is it's a line drawing to show the protocols of kissing around the world. So that in Paris, it's two kisses on the cheek. Mm -hmm. In Moscow, a smack on the lips. In Holland or Amsterdam, you've got the three three-way kiss on the cheeks and in new york it's the air kiss <laughs> <laughs> boy did i love this graphic and, and so he's I, just great he, he gave a, a keynote speech at uh, the presentation summit he was just great very funny very see funny now if man. he included los angeles in there it would be the botox uh lip <laughs> <laughs> very funny. i thought in la they just sniffed butts it was different but that's another uh, <laughs> sorry sorry back back to the dog metaphor <laughs> Okay, we won't go there. We won't go there. Yeah, please. All right, let's go to the next image. Okay, this is a, a, about visual hierarchy, which we might not talk about enough in e-learning. And it's just an example from a presentation. I'm always grabbing other people's examples. It shows a visual hierarchy uh, directs the eyes to what's most important on the screen or in a print-based ad and then to the second level, and usually to, there's a third level. You see it in newspapers, magazines, advertisements, billboards. And you can use pre-attentive processing, which we discussed before, to create your visual hierarchy. So in this case, size, which is something that's recognized mm -hmm. pre-attentive processly, uh, in pre-attentive processing, was used to create the visual hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So the very first thing you notice is ideas. And it's really important mm -hmm to think about every screen in an e-learning course and what do we want the learners or the viewers to look at first. And in this case, it's just a simple example. Text-based visual hierarchy, the largest item is first, and the next most important item is, is uh, smaller. So you, you can use size to create a visual hierarchy. Yeah, that's a really, that that's a really good one. Oh. And also when people design e-learning courses, one thing they rarely do is they don't, recognize the fact that eyes track from upper left to lower right so your contents all over the place and eyes are going up and down and sideways and it, it's really it doesn't serve any purpose or, or the, the worst US. thing people do the, the, the worst thing people do is they put the navigation interface in the upper right so yeah. now you're forcing people to go all the way down and don't pop back up and goes where's the interface oh there it is um simple things and it's amazing how often they get missed now, you know what's interesting? Um, the more I researched eye patterns, the more difficulty I had in really nailing it down because they're saying now that there's that certainly upper left seems to be where the eyes land, and they even think that's true on in cultures that read uh, the opposite direction hmm. than we do, although that's not 100% proven right, yet. Right. But th some of the other patterns they're saying are, are the Z pattern, at least for looking at websites, mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. an F pattern. So there are so many different patterns, but we can kind of count on the upper left. And the interesting thing about uh, the user interface for e-learning, you know, it's kind of... It's almost convention now to have it at the bottom. So right. I, I right. almost just go there. So we have to take convention into consideration, mm -hmm. too. It just gets complicated. Okay, I'm going to bring up the next image now. Yep. And in this case, someone, uh, the, per the group that created this presentation, it was an anti-smoking campaign, was they use contrast to create the visual hierarchy. So the lesser important items are more in the background and in black and white, and they used color to make the person in the front uh, stand out. Did you notice her first? I did. Yeah, yeah yep. me too. That oh, was just an example of a, a, another way that you can use visual, create a visual hierarchy. 
Okay, let's move on to the last one. And then the last one, I just wanted to mention quickly that one way to connect with an audience is through emotions. And one aspect of emotions that people often don't use, so often our e-learning courses or, or general, general training is very serious. And in this case, they use the element of surprise, which is an emotion, by putting signs in food. It was a, an information graphic, uh, an information video about uh, eating locally in Canada, and their, their purpose here was to show how far every item on the table traveled. And I just, I, when I saw the video, I thought, well, this is, a little, this is surprising. I, I never expected to see signs in food. They also animate everything, too, which is also cool. But yeah. I just wanted to remind people that you can use surprise to, essentially, I, I consider it a way to wake your audience up and get their attention. Sure. And that said, we got through all of it. All right. And great. Amazing. And we did that in about 22 minutes, which is pretty darn good. There's a lot of, lot of stuff that we could have really gotten into detail on. Um, great. Great information. Very okay. interesting. Yeah. You great. Know, like it's, it. it's so fascinating. It, it is. It is. And you have a, definitely a, a great way of, of communicating that to us. Oh, so. thanks. Yeah. Now, um, Anything before we kind of move on to our news story, anything that you'd like to, to promote about yourself? I, and I know that you have a, a new app. Um, I believe it's, for, it's an, an Apple app, right? So it's not an Android app yet? It's for the iPhone, and if um, people seem to like it, I will invest in making one for the Android. We'll, we'll, we'll see uh, what it is, uh, how it goes. So what this is, what I created real fast, it's a, uh, a, a glossary of about... 470 terms that instructional designers and e-learning people and educational technologists might bump up, bump up against during their day. So I usually have my phone out on my desk and I actually use it all the time when I need a Bloom's taxonomy or I forget what something means. I just, and that's why I created it. It just uh, has all these terms described in terms of an instructional designer's world. And um, what's, what's what it else. called? It's called, oh, I forgot. It's called Instructional Design Guru. Okay, great. I will look for it. Okay. I, That's I have, it. I have a lot of apps. Apps are good. Apps are good. And um, any talks you're going to be giving, any place that you're going to be in uh, Learning Solutions in March? Yes, and then Technology in January with, um, for hey, ASTD. Well, great. Well, Terrence and I will both be there, so we'll catch up with you then. Okay, yeah. great. I'm going to be talking about cognitive load. It doesn't get any more exciting than that. <clears throat> Boy, could we go places on that one. <laughs> anyway, how about well, the, uh, anybody in the chat room? Any questions? Uh, it was quite a, a lot going through the chat room. So at some point, Connie, if you get a chance, maybe even after the show, just kind of read through there. Um, I would love to. A lot of, lot of comments were, were being made and definitely people appreciating the, the content. But it looks like we got a, a last minute one here from Macro Fireball. Um, I'm not sure who that is. We but know who he is. Thanks for joining us. He's saying uh, he's been on the show. That's Mark Fletcher. Oh, hey, Mark. Hi, Talking Mark. of animation, can Connie speak about the effect of animation movement on the brain for e-learning? Okay. You would basically use animation, of course, I'm sure Mark knows this, when motion is part of, an important part of what someone needs to learn. And, anima and movement is definitely one of those things, one of those attributes that are discovered pre-attentively. So I know you've seen this. You go to the Weather Channel and there's someone, the Weather website, and there's so, some silly advertisement over on the right with someone dancing, and your eyes are immediately pulled to there. So, of course, you only want to use animation when you want people to look at it first, and you want to use it when... Uh, when motion is part of the learning. And an, well, another interesting thing, real quick, is that even seeing a photograph of someone in motion will activate the movement centers of the brain. So sometimes you don't even need to have motion if you just um, have a still of motion. Oh, and one other important thing I just remembered. It's really important to let learners, if it's something complex and something that they really need to learn, it's important to give learners control of animation so that they can step through it slowly on mm -hmm. their own. Yeah, rather than have that frantic animation, like a lot, of, a lot of animators go a little overboard with the animation, and as a result, 
it's interesting, but it doesn't really do anything. Yeah, a lot of times still frames in a series will get a sequence mm-hmm. will get the 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 um, information across better. And also, you don't want to split people's attention. You don't want to have text on the right and animation on the left. You should, if text is important, then integrate the text mm-hmm. into the animation. Well, look how effective Ken Burns was with just simple slow panning. Wasn't that beautiful? It was beautiful, and and it 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 said millions of words in just one pan. Really, really fascinating. Yeah. Thanks and, for the question. And with that, Terrence, we're going to go to the news. our news segment. Yeah. I didn't know we went to cowbell, cowbells for the news now. That's because my finger missed the actual. <laughs> this is what we were trying to get. And now the news. Uh. Uh, see, that sounds so much so much more powerful than cowbell. <laughs> cowbell I, that was almost like the come and get it dinner dinner ring, you know, out on the ranch. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here's so, our first story. All right, number one, we have – I'm just waiting for it to pop up there. Uh, yeah, Facebook. Uh, if you haven't noticed already, there is some new stuff coming out with Facebook. They have – uh, introduce what they call the timeline. Uh, I think it's really, really fantastic. You know, I'm a, I'm a social media uh, consumption hound, and I think Facebook is once again getting it right, and uh, once again putting Google so far in the shadows that uh, you know I don't even know if Google Plus is uh, you know showing any relativity relativity over the last couple of weeks. Um, but if you want to preview what the timeline looks like, I actually uploaded it to my site. And you can go to facebook.com forward slash Terrence Wing and subscribe, and that way you can see the... um, Now, uh, the timeline is one of the features most people hate right now, which is sort of interesting. Yeah, I think they'll get used to it. I'm glad Facebook did it. I mean, it's a whole other show to to talk about this, but... um, which I will be talking about at DevLearn next next month. So if if you're at DevLearn, you can definitely pop in my session on Facebook. And here's our second news item. Yeah. Oh, and not to mention, next week we have uh, Mari Smith talking about Facebook. So maybe that's a great time to to really dig into it. Uh, The next story here is uh, today the Enterprise Learning Conference actually started yesterday in Anaheim, California. So um, if you're in the area, you can pop in there. And I think they have a virtual conference too, so feel free to to, you know, pick up – tickets for that as well some of it is free so you may want to look into the at least the free stuff and then we've got our next item about google yeah kind of on the tailwind of uh the f8 announcements from facebook google is now open to the public so you don't need to be part of this exclusive list of of users 50 Um, million people signed up for google plus over the last weekend yeah that's a lot of people yeah 50 million signed up for it and 10 are using it maybe (laughs) <laughs> you know, I think they, like I said, it's another another show, but they, uh, you know, it, it it's a good platform, but the users are what makes the platform. Until people start act engaging on it, it's not a, uh, it's not going to pick up the the momentum that it needs. And our next story, uh, Jive Social Learning Platform, um, they are hosting their annual Jive World Conference next week in uh, Las Vegas. I will be there. I won't be presenting, but I will definitely be there. So. Um, Shoot me a tweet and, you know, let's do a meetup or something. And our last story. Last story. Drum roll. And our last story. Uh, CNN Tech, for, for you Kindle lovers, CNN Tech announced that the Kindle Fire will uh, be coming out soon, and that has a color display. So we'll, we'll see how far that goes. And it looks like that's going to be an Android device. Is it? Yeah, it's going to be an Android device. It's going to allow uh, – it's an LCD. It is no longer e-ink. Um, so it is, it's going to be interesting. But the key to the Kindle Fire is it's going to have complete integration with all of the Amazon services. Hmm. So it'll be interesting to see when it comes out. Seven inch, seven inch Kindle device. Uh, not Kindle, yeah, Kindle device. Sure, and it looks like Lily's saying it's coming out of her $199, or I don't know if that's $199. I don't think um, it's going to be an iPad killer, but you never know. No, they're different tools, much different tools. And that's it. That's it for the news. So join us uh, next week with Mari Smith talking about her new book and, um, and Facebook. She is uh, known as the queen of Facebook. And thank you, Connie, so much for, for joining us today. It was uh, amazing. I think you showed us some really useful, useful tools. Definitely appreciate it. Uh, it was so we... much fun. Thanks a lot. 
Well, Connie, we will see you next month at, uh, well, actually in about three months in uh, Las Vegas at Technology. And uh, thank you again for coming, and thanks, everybody, for being in the chat room. And for those watching the recording, please subscribe, and we will see you next week. For eLearn Chat, have a great one, everybody. Bye. Take care. Take care. Okay, and we are...